Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I am your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali BBQ Media production. It is very exciting to be here today with Andrew Glantz, the CEO and founder of At Gift a Meal. Uh, I first met Andrew, I want to say two years ago at the MirTech conference in Las Vegas. So multi-unit restaurant technology conference. I was asked to give a presentation, a, a, a talk on digital hospitality, on, on the thing that we hold near and dear to our heart, the reason why we have this show, the reason why we do our clubhouse calls. Uh, we believe that every business, especially brick and mortar businesses need to be digital first um, and every business is in the hospitality business. So we're all connected and we've never been more connected because of that device that's in our pocket where the intersection of content, commerce, communication and community live. And uh, I'm fortunate that this show provides me the opportunity to talk to the greatest founders in the space, the people that are moving the needle in the hospitality and restaurant space. And uh, it's been a long time coming, Andrew. So welcome to the show. Yeah, appreciate you having me here. Uh, do you remember uh, that Mirtech conference? Yeah, I think I probably still have like a video that you had all of us take in the audience of <laughs> like our neighbor or something like that. To post, I posted it on LinkedIn. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was an engaging one for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, anyone that listens to the show, if you're new to the show, welcome. But what we talk about is uh, one of the things my grandfather taught me, which is the three lessons of stay curious, get involved and ask for help. And um, I'm fortunate that I get to go to a lot of places and uh, give a lot of presentations, but it's always the people that are willing to get involved and ask for help. And you were one of those people. Um, because of that, I've been connected to you, uh, to your company, to your journey. And uh now we get to share with our, our listeners of, of what you're doing for restaurants and what you're doing for um, local communities. So, so tell us, tell us the gift a meal story. Give us the, the elevator pitch. You, you've been yeah. in many competitions, so <laughs> pitch us, pitch us the audience. Sure. The high level overview. I created gift a meal as a blend of marketing and giving back for restaurants. I saw that a lot of millennials like myself and Gen Zers and other audiences were looking to support businesses that give back and align with their values. Uh, and with restaurants, there were a lot of financial incentives like coupons and discounts, but not a lot that was really involving the customer in a give back experience where they would attribute that feel good uh, experience to that brand. And so I kind of pulled from a Tom Shoes, Warby Parker, buy one, give one model and tapped into the existing network of great local food banks across the country and looked to see how we could support them. Uh, so basically the way the gift a meal works is a guest simply scans a QR code at the restaurant, snaps a photo of their food or drink or even a selfie. And when they do that, we make a donation to a local food bank to give a meal to someone in need in their community. Uh, they're then given the option to share that photo on social media and we give an extra meal for each platform they share on. So if they share through gift a meal on Instagram, it's two meals, gift a meal on Instagram, Facebook, three meals and so on. And it's free for the guest and funded by the restaurant because again, we want that guest to attribute all of that positive impact and that positive feeling to the restaurant. So that way they return more frequently, uh, spend more, tip more and recommend the restaurant to friends. So give us some high level of uh, how big is the company? How, what kind of impact have you made? How many employees do you have? Give us the, the stats. Yeah, we've grown over the course of the last year from 200 restaurants to set over 700 restaurants in 35 wow. states. Uh, we are about to reach our 1.5 millionth meal uh, provided to those in need through 70 different food banks across the country. Uh, and it's just kind of growing every day. Uh, and so it's something that we're really excited about in terms of that impact that we can make. We're based here in St. Louis, but can work with restaurants all over the country from mom and pops who we started off with. You know, I didn't have a car when we started gift a meal and I was in college and I just kind of went door to door to mom and pop restaurants to get early proof of concept. I would be trudging through the snow and uh, trying to talk to these mom and pop owners and really learn the industry. Uh, and we started off with them, expanded throughout St. Louis and then signed up our first chain with Lion's Choice, a 30 unit roast beef chain. And um, then that showed us that we could work with a chain of that size. And then we expanded with chains in other markets and. Uh, now we work with franchisees, mom and pops, system-wide chains, kind of all over the place as we look to continue to grow. So tell me, let's talk about photo specific, since 
Uh, yeah. We've gone from a world of Instagram photo specific to now Instagram pushes reels and we live in a TikTok world um, that is more focused on short form video, but photos are still the thing that predominates anybody's camera roll. So talk to me about photo, talk to me about sharing. Um, what have you seen uh, as your app has evolved? Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because the act of taking the photo itself is just as important as the photo, because what we're looking for at the end of the day is creating that positive customer experience where the customer feels like they're putting in enough effort where they feel like they did something to warrant the impact that's being made to the local food bank, but not too much effort to the point that they're not going to do it at all. So a photo is that kind of sweet spot right in the middle where they don't need to like do some type of extended video that they need to edit. Um, it's not just like a check-in where they don't feel like it's anything. It's right in the middle where they feel like they did something. And then also the photo is nice for the photo itself when then you know their friends are gonna see that photo on social media and uh, can quickly grasp what that restaurant is. So I think that video has a really important role to play. And you know, as you were saying, Reels is becoming more popular and videos on TikTok and everything. But I think that photos still do tell a good story. Um, and also it's kind of for all different types of audiences and that quick snapshot without detracting from the customer experience with that, where in that restaurant, whether it's dine-in, takeout or delivery orders. And um, something that's pretty cool that we've seen is that through that act of taking the photo, even taking the social media shares aside, the customers using gift and meal on average are returning 39% more frequently. They're spending 20% more per order and they're tipping 32% more compared to an average guest that did not use gift and meal. And so that act of engaging in social responsibility in a way that's free for that guest and submitting that photo and the amount of effort involved is something that we see as really important in terms of driving the marketing value of gift and meal. When you're building your SaaS company, because that's essentially what you guys are, right? Yeah. How do you look at growth? I mean, I think that how, it's- how do, you get, at, how do you get yeah. in front of restaurant owners as opposed to trudging through the snow and knocking on doors when you actually want to get into growth mode? I mean, I think that the biggest challenge was getting that first big fish to commit. Uh, and because nobody wants to be the first, everybody wants it to be de-risked and to have early proof of concept. Uh, and so we kind of had that hometown advantage with Lion's Choice taking a risk on us with a 30 unit brand. And then the question was, can this succeed outside of St. Louis? And we got a franchisee with 20 units of Andy's frozen custard to join it. They had half in St. Louis, half outside of St. Louis. So it was kind of the perfect blend. And then we showed, okay, we could succeed with their locations, non-St. Louis in North Carolina and Kentucky. And then that helped us get a brand chicken cone to join system-wide across all of their locations. And then that helped us get a larger brand with Lee's Famous Recipe Chicken with all 130 locations. And once we reached that point, then we decided, okay, you know, this can work with anybody. Um, and then, you know, we started to see the floodgates open up and we had a 20 unit Red Robin franchisee with Lehigh Valley Restaurant Group join and um, started to get some of those logos of the larger brands with franchisees, as well as, you know, some mid-sized chains like Snarf's with their 33 locations or Groucho's Deli with their 29 locations, um, as well as some of the smaller chains like Native Foods with their seven locations they just joined. Um, and so it's been, you know, really about just kind of continually de-risking the concept uh, in order to get these other restaurants on board where it's still something that's fresh and new, where it's going to excite their customer base, but where they're not taking too big of a leap of faith. As far as the strategy goes, because it's easy once you have the logo, once you have the brand, you talked about local in St. Louis, and then once you get outside of St. Louis, but what's the... What advice would you give to somebody that's starting a tech company today on what you've learned and what you would do differently? The results are in National Restaurant Association show, Kyle and Sarah and myself. We were at the Davo sales tax booth and we were polling restaurant owners on the floor. This was a very unscientific poll, but the results are resounding. Restaurant owners do not like sales tax. Nobody likes sales tax. Doesn't matter what business owner you are, small business, big business, Davo automates the sales tax process. We are so grateful that Davo is the sponsor of this show. They automate sales tax at our Cali barbecue restaurants. It is $50 a month. It integrates with all the major point of sale partners, including Toast. So if you want to sleep at night, if you want to not worry about sales tax, 
go to Davo, check them out. Davo Sales Tax. Uh, let us know how they're helping automate your sales tax in your restaurant so that we can share your Davo story on digital hospitality. I think that the brand's identity and the personal identity of the founder are very intertwined, especially at the beginning of the business. And so just getting out there and being genuine and networking, I think is the best advice I'd have for an entrepreneur, whether it's for early customer acquisition, customer discovery, for building relationship with potential investors, for partners, for future hires. Uh, I think it's just kind of doing things the right way and being authentic and being willing to fail and being willing, like you said earlier, to ask for help um, and not pushing too hard with people, but, you know, giving them the option to help you. And uh, I think that that's something that's just kind of getting out there and doing it and learning and failing and iterating is just the process that you have to go by. And there's not really any shortcut for that. Who taught you? When, when, um, did, I mean, when you yeah, were I mean, a kid, were you, all, were you always willing to be uncomfortable and ask the uncomfortable <laughs> question? Raise your hand in class. Stay late. Uh, you know, I think it's something that I had an inclination for, but definitely I've learned from a lot of great people both in and outside of the industry. I mean, I learned the basics of doing a startup from um, a class called the Hatchery at WashU, where I went to college and learned how to put a pitch deck together. And then, you know, just kind of talking to other entrepreneurs and leaning on them for support and advice. And especially because sometimes your family and friends want to support you, but they don't really know what it's like to be in your shoes as an entrepreneur. So bouncing it off with our entrepreneurs um, when we've been in all the ups and downs of the roller coaster of entrepreneurship has been super helpful for me. Uh, but I think it's just kind of being continually willing to learn is something that's been helpful for me and uh, that I just kind of take day to day. So one of the things uh, I definitely want to talk about is writing. Mm -hmm. Why is writing so important to you? Writing, just in terms of in general? You and your updates, because since we've been connected, mm -hmm. you have kept me in touch with Gift Emil because of your commitment to publish email updates mm -hmm. personally about what you're doing, what the company is doing. And because of that, I'm guessing you don't get a huge response. So many people go, what's the ROI of putting content back into the world, writing or doing a podcast or doing video mm -hmm. or photos? You've made a commitment to this writing process. Um, I read every single email that you put out. You probably didn't know that, but I wanted to tell you that, I wanted to tell the audience that uh, the amount of work that I do on this show, my team does on this show and all the shows that we produce, sometimes you, even when you get the analytics and you see that people are opening it, you see that people are listening to it, you don't realize that people are actually reading it. So number one, I wanted to thank you for doing that, but why are you doing it and where did you learn how to do it? Yeah, thank, thank you for reading those emails too. I mean, I think that uh, one, <laughs> just send one them out thing, the yeah. and hope that someone reads them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you put in the time and effort. I think that uh, part of it is for my own self accountability with sending out those email journaling updates. Term, yeah, it's almost like journaling with external accountability, where I'm feeling like, okay, if I didn't make as much project pro progress this month, I'm going to be sending out this email update, and I don't want to be embarrassed that we haven't been able to make that much progress. So it's something that I can use as a self accountability tool, and then also just to keep relationships active and alive as I look to keep people up to date. Uh, you know, you can do things on LinkedIn, but to kind of show the the smaller successes and failures as they come, I think is really important. Uh, and being able to write in a succinct fashion, I think that is a skill that I've really focused on developing in order to best communicate that information, whether it's an email update, whether it's in social media posts or LinkedIn posts or any type of content that we're putting out there. Uh, I think it's really important to capture attention and then also uh, to be informative. So something that captures the intention and then delivers upon that intention to make it worth it. I mean, with those email updates, uh, I include our investors on those as well as some like personal contacts like yourself uh, and network contacts and uh, you know, with also some potential future investors as well. And uh, I remember a few years back, there had been somebody who was a judge at a pitch competition of ours and had early interest in gift a meal. Uh, we didn't end up winning that pitch competition. But then a couple of years later, when I announced on our monthly update that we were fundraising, he said, count me in and just responded to one of those emails after wow. no response from him for years. 
Um, and so, you know, like you said, it's hard to measure the ROI of those types of things, but um, I think the relationships are the most important things and having those genuine relationships and keeping people up to date in a way that's respectful of their time uh, is something that has been really beneficial. You talked about how important a personal brown, uh, brand is for a founder, um, mm -hmm. kind of tied in with the, the brand that you are founding and the brand story. Have you always been an extrovert online? <laughs> um, I don't even know if I would define myself as an extrovert. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I think that in, you say in terms of online, so I guess that's a little bit different. But I think that I've always been a go-getter, if you would call it that. And Do whatever um, it have, takes. Yeah, and I have a lot of ambition and motivation uh, and drive. And as a founder, I obviously believe very much in what I'm doing. I could... Uh, have another job that would be a lot safer than what I do at Gift a Meal and be paid a higher salary. But I choose to do this because I'm a true believer in what we're doing and the growth potential that it has. Uh, and so, yeah, I kind of do what I can to uh, put myself out there and make myself uncomfortable and put the company out there to continue to grow and, uh, you know, showcase that momentum because I think the momentum is a big driver for a startup. And so keeping showing that continual progress, like I said earlier, is a way to continually de-risk the startup in the eyes of some of these larger brands. And so I found that to be really helpful in terms of, you know, getting into the consideration set for customers that I might not have been able to otherwise. So recently you differentiated yourself in front of 35,000 different applicants. You applied for the Amazon 2023 business grant and gift a meal one. You yeah, <laughs> 35,000 businesses. How do you differentiate yourself in a pool that big? Yeah, I mean, I it's hard to answer that question because it's kind of throwing a dart at a dartboard when it's 35,000 applicants. But, you know, my belief is to always just kind of put my best shot out there. I think that for us, you know, being a social impact company that also delivers an ROI is something that's a special story. Um, you know, fighting hunger with photos is something that's a little bit unique. And so having that kind of unique spin to it, in addition to the numbers of the quantitative growth that we've seen, I think is a compelling story and then just about how you wrap it up. But I mean, I remember that uh, I'd applied for an ARCH grant, which is a grant in St. Louis for $50,000. If you agree to headquarter in St. Louis for at least a year, I had applied for that uh, five times and I got rejected every single time. And I would always ask for feedback and try to incorporate it. And then that fifth time I got rejected as well. And four days before the finalist pitch day, I got a call saying that somebody had dropped out who was a finalist and we were the next company on the cusp. And did I want to pitch? And I said, absolutely. And I didn't have my pitch deck ready, but I got it together. I pitched and we ended up winning the $50,000 grants on that fifth time, even though we rejected that cycle as well. And so that kind of just really taught me about resilience and never getting down on myself if I don't win something and not feeling resentment towards the judges of that competition. You know, it's just an opportunity that I can apply for. And if I don't get it, I don't get it. There's a lot of deserving people and companies and concepts out there, but I'm going to give it my all because I believe in myself and what we're doing that we're deserving of it. Well, I mean, I think for anybody that's listening, that's why story is so important. And that's why building in public and documenting your founder journey or whatever journey you're on is so important because for me, the compelling reason to make sure to get you on the show wasn't that you won uh, the third, the the grant, the twenty five thousand dollars. I mean, twenty five thousand dollars. Thank you, Amazon. But that's that's really not <laughs> a money. <laughs> like maybe a quarter of a million dollars, two point. <laughs> let's let's add some zeros to that grant. But obviously, it's any it's money. You know, it's money and it's proof of concept and. For me, what's more important is the fact that you've documented it along the way, because okay. now I'm cheering for Andrew and I'm cheering for Gift a Meal, and I want to see you succeed. And now I'm brought into the story. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really excited. Um, Amazon Business is actually flying out here to St. Louis next month, and they're going to wow. film a little video about Gift a Meal as well. And so, like you're saying. The $25,000 $25, for a startup, that is a big amount of money for us, yes. but it's a huge amount when we're looking at extending our uh, our burn rate and getting our runway further and all of that and being able to really invest in our tech and continue to grow our marketing efforts to expand. 
But you know that story that they're going to be filming uh, next month when they're going to be interviewing one of our partner restaurants, they'll interview one of our local food bank partners and um, interview me and our team and show kind of what the story of Gift and Meal is. Yep. So then that way we'll have that professional video content to supplement and complement our more organic uh, video content to really help tell that story in an effective manner uh, to a whole host of stakeholders. Bring me into user generated content because that's what the business model is built on. You, we've already been talking about the, the content that you generate, your own user yeah. generated written content. Um, but why is user generated content for the, for the restaurants that are listening, um, giving them a compelling reason to give back, to do something that isn't just a promotion? What, why is that so important? Yeah, I think the user generated content is definitely seen as the most authentic and genuine. Uh, you know, if somebody's just looking at a professional photo that a restaurant is posting, they're thinking, is that food going to actually look like that? Or is it just kind of like propped up like that for the commercial? And so seeing something posted by a friend or something posted by a customer from that restaurant builds that level of trust and authenticity, which is especially important for Gen Z and millennials. I also think that it shows that larger sense of connection between the restaurant's customers and the restaurant itself because it's showcasing, hey, we're promoting something that our customers have shared out. It gives, if a customer posts about the restaurant social and the restaurant responds to that customer, that it's starting that conversation and continuing to extend that sense of hospitality that that customer felt in the restaurant. But now when they're at home, when the restaurant's responding to them on social media as well. So I think that user-generated content is extremely important. Um, and it's definitely something that restaurants should tackle as they look to see how they can best incentivize people to promote that user-generated content in an authentic manner. Are there any restaurant technology founders that you look up to that are mentors? Yeah, I think there's tons of them. I mean, I think um, one of the first ones that really inspired me when I heard him speak at a conference and talked to him afterwards was Noah Glass from Olo. Um, you know, he founded Gift and Meal, or not Gift, he founded Olo when he was in his 20s and uh, you know, in the early days, it was slow growth, and then he persisted with it and then started to take off. And, uh, you know, also on a personal level, uh, he's done a great impact for fighting hunger as well, which is obviously something important to me. And um, he serves on the board of No Kid Hungry, Share Our Strength, and has made a really great impact there. And um, also at Olo, they have Olo for Good. And one of our advisors um, was one of the uh, employees that helped create Olo for Good, Seth Hall. Uh, when he was over at Olo. And um, so I think that I really look up to Noah and what he's done uh, there. And then, you know, there's lots of other tech founders that I look to learn from, you know, if I'm ever um, seeing any of the founders or CEOs of these other companies speak at conferences, whether, you know, it's Zach at Thanks or Nabil from Lunchbox or um, whether it's um, Andrew, who's actually just becoming chairman instead of CEO of Patronics, like for these different loyalty companies, um, you know, those are all competitors with each other that I just named, but I think that you can always learn from different people and learn from different leadership styles and the different ways that the products are displaying themselves. And so I just try to absorb as much as I can from all different types of entrepreneurs who run their companies in different ways, and then look to incorporate the pieces that I think align with myself and my personal values into the way that I construct and lead Gift Meal. How do you choose which conferences to attend? Um, it's a good question. A little bit is based off of cost as an entrepreneur and trying to network my way to find yep. different ways in or if I can speak at a conference and get free admission to the conference. And that's always good. And then I think it's just about where I've seen historically the return on investment in terms of those relationships I've developed, uh, whether it's uh, you know, this is a conference that I feel like I can really build relationships with the other vendors for potential partnerships, or this is one where I meet a lot of great prospects that really fit our target customer. Um, like, for example, for us, we're usually talking to the VP marketing or the CMO or um, local uh, marketing person, local store marketing or field marketing. And so those conferences where I can meet people like that. Um, and so I just kind of look historically and then also talk to others in the industry. And I just try to test it out. And if there's one conference that doesn't do as much for me, then I just, you know, learn to focus my efforts elsewhere on a different conference the next year. You don't put them in the email update and say, don't go to this conference. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. 
what is digital? I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in not bad mouthing anyone or anybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I take, I take it that way. You don't, you don't think me as somebody that will going to have a strong opinion, negative strong opinion that's going to publish the negative strong opinion. You just yes. move, move on. Yes, there's, there's yeah. a way to go about it for sure. Uh, yeah. What does digital hospitality mean to you? I think that it's connecting with the customer beyond the four walls of that restaurant. So whether that's off premise and making them still feel that sense of hospitality and connection to the restaurant or continuing that sense of connection to the restaurant's brand when they're not dining at the restaurant. Or if you're looking at dine-in today, uh, when there are so many other options for consumers, uh, look, their consumers really need to have a reason to dine in at a restaurant and have that sense of an experiential visit. And so digital hospitality is then how are you going to make that visit more additive and more experiential for that customer without adding any extra layers that are going to detract from that customer experience. So I think it's just all about building and adding and extending that customer experience and the connection to the brand. When you think of outside of the four walls, and we're talking about a digital ecosystem, but then when you bring the impact side of the food banks, mm -hmm. talk about the extension piece of what you're what you're truly building. Yeah, I mean, take down the four walls of that restaurant, and restaurants are by their nature ingrained in the communities in which they serve. They are hiring people from the communities that they operate in. They're serving people food in the communities that they operate in with their customers. Um, they're getting publicity from local media and they're looking to see how they can drive that local traffic, whether it's a mom and pop or a chain. And so giving back to those communities is something that's gonna really resonate in a meaningful and impactful way with their customers and their staff. And so finding a way again to genuinely engage with their communities that really speaks to those values of both their customers, their staff, and to the restaurant's brand identity itself is something that I found to be extremely important and motivating. I mean, the, one of the reasons I created Gift a Meal, like I said earlier, is that myself and other millennials and Gen Zers are looking to support brands based off of the values of that brand. And if there's a way the brands can showcase that they care about giving back to their communities, especially in a way that doesn't just seem like a Band-Aid, but it's actual genuine care, um, that's something that can really go a long way. Um, and I think that with Gift a Meal, one of the big things that I've looked to do is to see how can we make it that social giving can be done in a way that doesn't add any extra effort on the operation side for staff with no extra logistics. Uh, and that is something additive to that customer experience while still making that meaningful and relevant social impact as well. One of my favorite quotes is that we overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in five years. What is gift a meal going to look like five years down the road? Yeah, I mean, my goal would be 20,000 restaurants providing over a million meals to those in need annually. But, you know, the sky's the limit. There's over 600,000 restaurants in the United States alone. We've got an interest internationally for gift a meal, uh, which is something that I always battle with because I want to make sure that I have my focus aligned and that we're not spreading ourselves too thin. Um, but, you know, we could be international at that point and uh, really looking to put a dent in hunger and find a way to continually evolve to support partner restaurants and local food banks. That's amazing. What's the best way if somebody, uh, if we have restaurant owners that are listening, that they're, they're interested in the program, give us, give us the elevator pitch. What, what kind of costs are we talking about? Um, how do they sign up? How does everything work? Yeah, so a restaurant for a single location, it's $59 a month flat rate. Um, that covers all the costs of the donations and promo materials and things like that. So it's really easy and predictable for them to join and they can launch within a week. For a chain restaurant, it's discounted based off of the number of locations from anywhere from $34 per month per location to $55 a month per location. Uh, the pricing is all public on our website. So if you go to giftameal.com slash partner, you can view it. We're big into transparency anyone, as a company. Did, did anyone advise you not to do that? Yes, but if I'm a customer of any service, I don't want to waste my time and take a demo with somebody. If I don't know what the price is, that's going to be my first question. Because uh, if it's on the budget, then you know I don't want to, I want to be respectful of somebody's time. Uh, but yeah, if somebody wants to take a demo, giftameal.com slash demo. They can set up a 10-minute Zoom demo to take a look at it. We can give you the 10 slide pitch about gift a meal. 
walkthrough of what this can look like for your restaurant. You can also email me personally at andrew at giftandmeal.com. Um, and always happy to chat through, through there as well. So how are we going to turn your email updates into blog content? It's a good question. I think that it's just a matter of time uh, and being stretched in as a founder when wearing a lot of different hats. Uh, but I like that idea. Um, I started to do um, some articles in some trade publications. Like I wrote an article um, in Nation's Restaurant News about the importance of giving back locally um, and modern restaurant management about um, reaching millennials and the Gen Z market um, as well. Um, and I am working on a piece right now about user-generated content, uh, actually, so it's uh, good timing that we were talking about that. Uh, but in terms of blog content for our website, uh, yeah, I think that's something that I definitely should do. It's just there's a lot of things I should be doing as a founder that uh, sometimes, you know, get knocked down the priority list, but you're reminding me of the importance of storytelling and uh, definitely should be something to prioritize. If somebody's listening and they want to get this uh, Andrew update, how do they get it? Uh, email me and develop a relationship with me. I don't just add anybody to the email okay, update. Like it. um, yeah. It's more is, if I have I like a personal. Possible. Yeah, it's more if I have like a personal relationship with somebody. Okay, good to know. Yeah. I like it. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but people can also always follow along with. They can follow me on LinkedIn um, in order to see my updates there as well. Perfect. Well, Andrew, uh, we love what you're doing. We love what you're building. Uh, grateful to have you on as a guest and a reminder to anybody that's listening. Uh, we always meet on Wednesday and Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time on the social audio app Clubhouse. That is a way for you to get involved. Uh, if you are in restaurants, if you're in hospitality, if you're in sales, marketing, content creation, it's a way to join the community. Uh, we say stay curious, get involved. Um, you can come on stage and tell us who you are, what you're building. Um, meet the community, and uh, and then finally ask for help. You never know. Uh, you're one ask away from changing your business, changing your life. And uh, Andrew, I'm grateful that you took the time to come up and say what's up after MureTech, and you've kept in touch all this time, and I, I can't wait to see what you continue to build. Yeah, I appreciate all of your support, and thank you again for having me on. I really appreciated the opportunity. Absolutely. You guys can reach out to me anytime. It's at Sean P. Walchef. Uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, threads, all of those things. Uh, we appreciate you and uh, we'll catch you guys next week.